Eric, Omar, there's a lot to talk about here. There is. In fact, there's two things to talk about here. Two principal. Two to three. Yeah. Some would say a trinity, but for us, we're a duo. We don't need no third. Um, it's the rule of two. The Sith no. Now, there's a few things there. We're going to get right into this. Folks, there is no intro. We're just going right to the topic du jour. And that is we're reading a review. And the review, would you want, Eric, uh, you want me to read the five-star review or the one-star review? Because since we read the last review, which, folks, it's on iTunes. This is our way of interacting with you. We're not actually interacting with you. Like, it's not live and there's an exchange of, you know, people communicating with one another. It's more, we read what you say, then we just talk back to you, and then we don't, then there's no more communication. It's actually just one direction. Nonetheless, Eric, what you want, champ? We got two reviews. Full disclosure, everyone, one's a five-star. One's a one star. That is useful information. So yeah. as you know, Omar, that I have an extremely fragile ego. Yep. <laughs> um, and to take a hit, I need to be built up pretty high. So we're going to have to start with that five so that I don't cry on camera when we hear the one. Oh, God. So folks, Eric actually doesn't have a fragile ego. What he does have is a fragile neck. I know this from 2018. <laughs> Before we, this is true. Why I just said, Eric, I, don't, I, I told Eric, I said, I don't like Eric the way these individuals are looking at us, and this is true. And Eric's my boy. He's like, Eric, I got you. He said, Omar, I got you. Just know with this neck, I could probably take one punch, and <laughs> that, that might be it. And I was, in my head, I was like, noted. But this man was right there. He's in the thick. He's he's the man that's got your back. So, I mean. It would also end the conflict. Like, if, if a person gets punched <laughs> and they crumple to the floor as a quadriplegic, that fight stops for, for, for better or for worse. And I know that you at least wouldn't. I mean, it would be the, the worst injury that I could possibly sustain. But you would not get a black eye. And <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give it up for you. So. Damn. What a, what a hug. Okay, so five stars it is. Um, you'll like this one. So it's by John. <clears throat> and it goes, monster episodes from a monster podcast. And once again, folks, Apple iTunes. We're not endorsed by them, but that's where you can leave a rating review. Spotify has to get a shit together because we would like to do that as well there, but that's where you can leave the rating and reviews that we read constantly. Okay, John, five stars. I'm consistently impressed by the quality of the Iron Culture episodes, but I was glued to my seat with the in-person episode reflecting on Sheffield. Truly, it was a monster episode. The only way it could have been more monstrous would have been to extend the episode three hours with a session of the Call of Cthulhu RPG featuring Omnar Innsmouth, Eric Holmes, and Connor Out of Space Heffernan. There, the real monsters lie. Five stars. So let me just say a couple things. One, rule of two plus one, shout out Connor Heffernan. Uh -huh. um, unofficial, equal, but not as equal third guest host. Yeah. What's a guest host? I don't know. Yeah. You'd have to check out the old episodes of the Stronger by Science podcast to learn that. I have actually played the uh, Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. It's pretty awesome. There's a setting in the 1890s. There's a setting in the 19-teens or 1920s, I think. And there's also the 1990s setting. It's probably been updated because the 1990s one when it came out was the, the quote-unquote modern one. It's great. It's one of the few role-playing games where when you make your character... The expectation is this this character will die or go insane after four or five games. So like you can't get too attached, you know? Um and like, you know, in most role playing games where you make like a wizard or a spellcaster, they have the potential to be like one of the most powerful characters because they can do like like, you know, a fighter gets better, they just get really, really good at fighting. But if you have a mage, they can potentially do unexpected things, surprise the the game master and change the outcome of the plot or even the the tide of a battle, right? If you try to get magic through the study of the occult in uh, in the Call of Cthulhu role playing game, you are more likely to go insane trying to do so and lose control of your character than you are to actually get any useful spells. Or like you summon this creature and then it just kills your whole party. So it's it's uh, it's a great game. I like it. You have to be down with the uh, the nihilism to play it. So a Thank you for that review and that shout out to something uh, that, uh, that very few people know about and have played um, really interesting uh, uh, comments. And it brought me back to my, to my younger days. Eric, let me just say that for those that can discern exactly what we really mean when we say these words, yeah, we've been traveling. Okay, so we went to Europe. 
Um, and someone might say, hey, if I take a look at ley lines, which are very real, it seems like the locations you guys went to are related to some unexplained occult events that occurred some period of time ago that seem to line up with some prophetic ideas of the end of the world. And all we can say is that we may or may not be preventing some sort of outcome from happening, but nonetheless, there's a reason why there's power in the stone. We are atop a pyramid. Connor is atop an obelisk, and we're here to prevent some sort of calamity. And that's all probably we should say, because we don't want our audience going insane. Eric, do we? No. And I was <laughs> recently in Mexico, and mm -hmm. I was recently at Teotihuacan, mm -hmm. City of the Gods, named mm -hmm. by the Mexica, the Aztecs. Yep. Uh, and that was an abandoned city that had fallen into disrepair uh, hundreds of years before the Mexica even found it. And um, coincidence that I was at ancient pyramids in in the uh, the Americas while previously we were just in Europe? Maybe, maybe not. Eric, we were at Irish Stonehenge. I believe I could say that. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's actually what it's called, but not, nonetheless. <laughs> it's definitely not called that, but we, 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 we were <laughs> in a graveyard where there were stones. So same thing. Okay. So the second review is actually going to lead to our first topic. Um, and so here's one star, uh, Eric, as I said, um, it's by it's a, it's a blog crane. Cool. So uh, sticking with the horror theme here, have this horseman like it, not science. It says, okay. So it's one star. Fair enough. I listened to the carnivore diet episode. And while I understand the overall apprehension about such a diet, it is so clear that these guys didn't study up. They focus solely on the fact that the carnivore diet attracts fringe anti-establishment folks, which isn't wrong, but they don't actually get into the science. I recommend instead you listen to Dr. Ken Berry or Dr. Anthony Chaff instead. Now, one thing I should say, Eric, for those that don't remember, we had our main man, Eric Trexler on. That's where we flipped the, the, the uh, co-host. He did it with me. And to give Trexler, because he was the chief science communicator on that episode, I thought he did a remarkable job. It was about two hours long. He definitely, because he shared with me his outline, his like, uh, 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 what do you call it, the research that he was citing, and it was pretty damn robust. And I know he spent his time, and I would say we spent, Eric, the majority, sometimes, yes, with some topics, like for myself, we could be a little sarcastic, cynical, I could be flippant uh, with my attitude. And it may come across that one's not taking the topic seriously, but I do think that Trexer, to his credit, I thought he did a remarkable job. Maybe I could take uh, some responsibility. Yeah, yeah, you you sense a little bit of attitude on my part. But the question I have for you, and I do thank this person for leaving this review, it seems that there are some topics, Eric, that are they're controversial because, let's say, the establishment in quotations or the scientific consensus might be in opposition to some of these beliefs or, or the logical endpoints of some of these beliefs. Let's say like some uh, carnivore uh, diet, pro-carnivore diet people would say that vegetables are bad for you, like some of those endpoints, what they espouse. Okay, whatever. Um, that because they are on the fringe, that it becomes harder to take them seriously. And it seems like in those conversations, the people that have those firmly entrenched beliefs, um, even if you steel man the positions, um, not that it's never good enough, but I feel that Eric, because Eric was actually on ancient workouts with Omar, interestingly enough, uh, Eric, talking about the carnivore diet and that, you know, that, that show is very just straightforward. Eric was there for four minutes, just delivered straight information. So there, there was no attitude, no iron culture flair, and yet it still kind of embroiled him. That's what we joked in some controversy. So my question, man, for you as a science communicator, like how do you navigate this path right here where you want to talk about some of these topics, right? That might be uh, hotly contested in certain circles. I'm not talking about the scientific establishment, but these firmly entrenched beliefs without kind of pissing off some of the people that believe in them, but while still communicating your point, to what lengths do you go and how do you see this whole situation with some of these topics? It's a really tough one. I'm not going to lie. And um, it's not something that I necessarily have completely figured out and have the flow chart. Um, because there is a there is a cost to addressing it, unfortunately. Yep. Um, when you have something that ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, it is extremely clear that um, the science does not support the efficacy or the benefits um, as presented of of a carnivore approach to eating, and that there are not only just not the potential benefits, but actually potential harm. Um, 
whether we're talking, you know, performance, because it's essentially a ketogenic diet, um, not in all cases, but more or less forces you to be that way. Um, it, so it doesn't have a lot of the elements that you would want there to be for performance. And then for health, it's lacking a ton of things as well. So uh, it's, it's this, uh, like, like the person who, 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 who made this comment, I'm very sympathetic to them because just like there are in most spaces, there are people who are doctors who are citing research to talk about it in a favorable way. Is the research accurately represented? At best, yes. The research article they're specifically talking about, yes. Is the interpretation and application? Almost never. So in the case of the carnivore diet, just so we're clear, um, most of the time they're looking at mechanistic data on uh, like defense mechanisms that plants have against animals and then extrapolating, oh, like plants are therefore toxic. You don't want to eat them, all these negative things. Combine that with anecdote. Hey, I went carnivore and I felt a lot better. It's just, you know, <laughs> if you have any kind of issue and you eliminate 90% of the, uh, the food in your diet and it's related to something you eat, it might get better. You know, if you have FODMAP issues, if you have a gluten sensitivity, whatever, if you only eat meat, that at least will go away. Um, and then there's also the power of belief and, and uh, the quote unquote placebo effect. And you combine all of that and you also loop it into things like views of masculinity or uh, beliefs about the superiority of what, not actually what they did, but what you believe a Paleolithic era person did, kind of going back to our quote unquote roots. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about Liver King, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and if you also loop it in with the fact that we see the fitness industry go in cycles, like all of us kind of evidence based people 15 years ago were like, Oh man, veganism is really blowing up right now. We, I bet you in a few years, there's going to be a carnivore diet. Ha ha ha. And we were right, unfortunately. Um, so it's entirely predictable. So it is very difficult to take seriously yeah. uh, when you're actually familiar with all the research, but it's very, very understandable to why someone whose initial exposure to something like this might be someone who is an MD or a PhD with a certain position and they're talking about it. And it gets very convincing because they're getting science broadly right or scientific facts correct, um, but they're misrepresenting it. And it can sound very convincing, especially if they're a good order. And if they're being positioned on a large podcast, like say the Joe Rogan podcast or whatever, which by the general populace and the listeners is seen as a, at least science communication adjacent podcast, which yeah. it is maybe in all honesty, 20% of the time, you know, and the other 80% of the time is pseudoscience or science is marketing. Yeah. Um, and if you're wondering, what are the 20% of the time that's good? Like, Hey, when they have Andy Galpin on, yeah. when they have Lane Norton on, that's, that's, that's fantastic. But unfortunately the, those guys get invited on when there's clamoring of, Hey, you've gotten this so wrong about this that they finally throw a bone to, uh, that. So it's, it's a challenging thing. You know, you're listening to a mainstream podcast. You've got a doctor on there talking about science. You've got someone popular platforming them. And there's no reason to expect someone who doesn't have specific training in this area to not buy into it. And um, I remember when I first got exposed to nutrition, my first exposures were to some of the, like the keto crowd mm. in the mid 2000s. And I did things like uh, very early on in my career, didn't last long, not combining carbs and fat because of insulin and thinking that generally a good diet was one that is as low in carbohydrate as you can while still being able to do your thing and then high in pro very high in protein and then the rest should be fat. And that wasn't like disastrously wrong, but it's not the position I hold now or one that's largely supported by science. And that's just an example. Um, so the, the problem here is that you will want to be dismissing the influencers and the scientists because you're, you're frustrated with them because you know they clearly have an agenda um, sometimes they come by it honestly, it's just a belief they have and they happen to also have a doctorate or sometimes they're actively selling you something, um, or both. Uh, and those things are not necessarily clear cut separate things. So you're going to have this sense of, uh, disgust, uh, and dislike of the people who are actively taking advantage of the public and potentially doing harm. And it's hard to not have that come across. And when you attack someone for being a charlatan, 
it's a little different in the social media age because they have followers. They have people who felt they've had a positive influence on them. They are they have believers when it really comes down to it, um, and they stand for all those things that this person brought up and acknowledged the anti-establishment kind of distrust. So, it, as soon as you do that, you get lumped in with the something something industrial, you know, blah 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 complex, you know, pharmaceutical, I don't know, academia, ivory tower, whatever. So there's a, there's a lot of lose loses here for you. Um, the other lose is that not only are you pissing off followers in that person, um, and you think you're doing a public service, but it's already a fringe belief. So the carnivore diet is not something that a lot of people are following in the grand scheme. It is enough that you get vocal people on social media, and it's certainly more than it used to be, but it's nowhere near, say, the size of low carb adherence <laughs> or say uh, vegan diets. And there's a lot in that space that's worth talking about. And you need to talk about it respectfully because they're not completely bankrupt ideas. You know, you can absolutely make a low carb diet work and it might be useful for some people. And there's a lot of people who are going to choose to eat a vegan diet for ethical reasons that are completely you know, irrelevant to their beliefs upon health or performance. But because they're in a group and they have the voices in there that see this as a good thing, there's biases of, oh, and it's also better for performance you know, thinking about game changers or, oh, and it's also better for, for health without thinking about why, or what's the components like it being the presence of plants rather than the absence of animal products. And, um, you know, just to kind of give big ups to our man Trexler, he is someone who follows a vegan diet, but he's also someone who dispels the myths that the vegan diet is better for performance or health because he's purely looking at it as a scientist. So, um, I think that should give some kudos and credibility to the fact that he's a science communicator first before he lets his personal biases influence his conclusions to the degree that any human can. I think he's, you know, doing the best job he can. So all this is to say, Omar, that if you sit there and you steel man the carnivore diet, for example, and you talk about it and you really give it a lot of airtime, it gives the appearance to people who are not in that fringe group already and who are not seriously considering it and who would have a negative knee-jerk reaction to it it shifts them to having a more of a, a neutral initial reaction to it. Like, oh, the carnivore diet is something that's being considered on the scientific podcast, discussed. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not being belittled. Yep. And I don't think belittling it's useful either. So that, like I said, lose, lose. Um, but all of a sudden now it's in the reasonable scope of discussion. And it's kind of the same way in politics, how you can get, you know, nationalists, you know, and, and like fascists or extreme, you know, rad radical left or right on either side of the spectrum. Once they can kind of get their foot in the door, there's actually terms for this in, in political science, and they can make it something that gets discussed in the mainstream, it gets considered and it gives an opportunity for more radical beliefs or leaders with closet radical beliefs to be in a position of power that normally they would not. Um, and we have examples of this. I think obviously the most notable one is is Hitler, right? Yeah. So I'm... Typically, when someone brings up Hitler in a conversation, they've they've gone full deep end and they're going crazy. That's not what's happening here. All I'm saying is it's a parallel to that fringe political beliefs in a relatively short period of time can become mainstream enough for them to take hold and cause problems in society. And I think the same thing can happen with really any idea. So I don't like to spend a whole lot of time on, say, the carnivore diet or other fringe diets before they become more mainstream. For the same reason, I suspect that a astrophysicist doesn't want to deal with flat earthers until it becomes something that you have to deal with where, you know, <laughs> like we've seen the ones where NBA stars have said like, oh, I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube and I was convinced that we didn't land on the moon or whatever. So it's, it's this frustrating thing where they, these, these pockets of information, these bubbles and these communities that exist because of the structure of the internet and the way that humans do group think, um, can capture people who are otherwise reasonably rational and then they don't get exposed to counter ideas they don't necessarily have the initial training and it's and it's not that they're dumb i think that's a that that's a misnomer and it's something that when i'm frustrated it's what i want to do i just want to throw away all conspiracy theorists and fringe believers this is stupid but that is really really not helpful and if anything that pushes people more towards that type of, of thinking and it's also arrogant to think that I couldn't fall into that, but I know I have. Like I mentioned how early, early on in my career, I kind of went uh, probably too too far to the keto side. Um, so it's a, it's a tough one. I think 
it's important to frame it. And that's what I'm doing in a much longer form than I normally would. But to answer your question more directly, if someone, if I'm doing an IG live, yeah. right, and someone asks about the carnivore diet, the first thing I say is we have decade long observational studies, we have meta analysis, we have short term studies. We have all this data and there's literally a, a very easy and irrefutable scientific consensus that suggests that uh, uh, plants are, are and, and basically vegetable products in a plant-based diet is beneficial for you. Yeah. And there's nothing that can change that. And this is really important for you to understand, listener. You might hear about some isolated study about some mechanism, but ultimately when the rubber hits the road, if that mechanism was true, we wouldn't have meta-analyses showing a graded dose response of the more vegetables you get up to like five to nine servings per day being associated with positive outcomes. If this thing that this doctor is talking about, this prominent podcast who sounds really smart, was doing that, that would be an impossible observation to observe. It would have to be of such a small magnitude that maybe all the other things, the confounders, quote unquote, supersede it. So at best, what we're looking at here is this thing that has some mo small minor impact that gets washed away by other aspects of health, healthy living that are present in people who eat, eat a lot of vegetables. But that's the worst it could be. And that's not what that, that person is saying who's promoting the carnivore diet. They're saying plants will kill you. Plants are poison and you'd be better off removing them from your diet. So it, it's, I start off my answer with that, with a very firm um, re refutation and calling to the highest forms of evidence to immediately say and indicate this is, this is not a science-based belief. And kind of setting the stage of here's the way you assess evidence, um, because it's very confusing to someone new to the space to tell the difference between having an evidence-based belief where they consider the whole field of science versus basing a belief off of what someone else told me about one or two studies uh, that, that don't take into the rest of the context and are then supported by anecdote. Because it still seems strong. I've got a doctor, they've got a study, and they've got these anecdotal experiences, and they make these convincing, logically consistent arguments. But if that's all I'm exposed to, yeah, why wouldn't you, you know, go carnivore? And you have to actually have someone tell you, oh, we actually have decades of observational research. We have some randomized controlled trials for short-term periods on specific things. And we have all these various studies and they all show the same thing. And the thing that they rule out is that plants are killing us. Um, that's just not what we're seeing. We don't see vegans dying left and right, right? Because the, all they're consuming is toxins, right? So it, it makes it very challenging to, to address some of these issues when someone has already been indoctrinated, right? And um, I could be wrong about this, but the person who gave that one-star review, because I did listen to that episode, I, I, it was a cool thing we did. We did a little April Fool's Eric swap uh, on Stronger by Science and Iron Culture. I wouldn't listen to it. Eric killed it. And he was very measured and he went through science. So if the person listened to the whole episode, either they have such a strong bias that they were just unwilling to consider that science as science, or they got the initial sniff that it was going to be a, a, you know, basically a, a, dis, a, a refutation of the efficacy of a carnivore diet and they pieced out. Uh, and they, they based that off of some comment you made or some impression they got. So this person writing this one-star review is not someone you can really convert anyway, yeah. right? At least at this point. I'm not saying there, it's, it's always going to be off the table, but a lot of the people who you're going to be engaging with in this space or any space like it are not necessarily there to change their beliefs. So the only benefit you get with engaging with them is that other people are watching. And then you have to contend with what I mentioned earlier, that they may already have a immediate dismissal of the idea of cutting out all carbohydrates or cutting out all vegetables or that plants are poison. And then by having a, a science communicator who they respect, giving it the kind of attention that's really, really fair and balanced. It's kind of like those quote unquote fair and balanced political shows where they have like a, they have like a talking head come on who has the opinion of whatever the, the network or the opinion show wants it to be left or right. And then they have the, the actual political scientists or the policymaker or who, like the actual expert, and they're given equal weight to be quote unquote fair and balanced, yep. but it's absolutely not a fair and balanced thing, you know? So it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And I think you have to be very careful and until the carnivore diet becomes something that is as mainstream as low carb diets or as mainstream as a vegan diet, Omar, I'm probably... It's like, if there's 10 questions on my IG live, 
and one of them is carnivore, I'm not going to get to that one because it, is, it has the least amount of utility and actually potential harm for all those reasons. Eric, very well said, man. It, it's something that we've both thought about, we've spoken about on our own culture, you know, uh, trying to communicate these ideas, you know, disseminate it uh, to the masses. Like, how does one approach it? And certainly, I think you can be too smug even approaching topics that should be givens. Like, at that, that absolutely can take place. At the same time, to your point, I think it's almost like a compensatory mechanism on occasion that the communicator will be a little glib or what have you when presenting certain information because some of these things should be givens. And it's like, to what extent are we baking in certain assumptions, right? Like where if someone will ask a question, it's like, well, we have to actually rewind that because what you're asking is multi-layered and there's like five assumptions baked into that. And you want to avoid the situation potentially of kind of a -a whack-a-mole where on the surface, the question, the question is fine. But to your point, Eric, it's like, okay, if I'm now legitimately considering what you're saying and we have to walk through all these steps, how many steps do we want to do before we arrive to the conclusion? So at what point are we agree? Like, what's our baseline level of agreement so that when we follow along on this logical train of thoughts that, like, let's say a Trexler is presenting, that we can agree. Do we agree on point one? Okay, let's go to point two. Oh, no, no, you don't agree on point one. Like, there's deviations here. You're, what about this? What about that? What about this? And the what aboutism. In theory, asking these questions or raising some of the points, because I read, uh, Eric, um, some of the um, responses or the comments uh, to that episode when we did it over a year ago. Again, some were well-intentioned, but some would essentially obfuscate us from arriving actually at the eventual truth because Eric spent, Trexler spent two hours on the podcast. So I agree a thousand percent that there's that fine line of like, how much do I want to even platform like this idea or this way of thinking? So the one that, you know, and again, uh, you could read the expression on the face where we talk about, you know, plants being extremely harmful to humans, right? Like that is one that, of course, we get disproved with the with the data, with the information. But even that notion, you you want to accept that someone genuinely believes this because they're told by someone. And I think what sometimes, and I see maybe amongst other communicator uh, communicators, Eric, I don't know if you would agree, is that they're not being smug, I hope, against the person asking the question because there's no problem asking a question. There's no problem with this person that generally wants to know or maybe from their own personal point of view, they've derived great benefit. And so they're wondering how can this be in Congress, right? Where I'm doing this thing, I feel better, but what you're saying is wrong. So it's like a value-based kind of attack on me. I think that for some of the communicators, some of the perceived like smugness or whatever the case might be is not against any individual, but it's yep. against like the predatory behavior that they're observing. And because they are the educator, I, I mean, no offense when I say this, they know better than like, oh, okay, like I, I understand, like you think that plants are bad for you. Like that's definitely not the case. And I don't know if I'll be able to reach you on this one. I'm going to try. And to your point, Eric, the thing that we've always wanted to avoid with iron culture, it is for all lifters. Um, I think to us, I don't know how you regard it. It's kind of like we're inviting people into our house. Like you, you and I, like we're cooking up dinner. Okay, we're getting our macro compliant meal. We're sitting down and having a chat. There's a baseline level of kind of respect of some of the ideas and notions. Banter is normal. Like we have banter all the time between us or joking about things. We try and have an openness to the conversations that anyone can follow along. But there does reach a point with some of these topics As you exactly said, like, let's take flat earths. Let's switch the kind of lanes for a second here. Almost the more you talk about it, the more, because some people will be naturally like more of a contrarian or it'll lead them down a rabbit hole, right? And because this isn't like our field of uh, study or their field of study, you can be influenced, right? You could go down the YouTube rabbit hole, the algorithm. So it's like even a fine uh, detail here, the question of how much time does one spend on this topic and then how do they treat it? So I think uh, from my perspective, like that's why I, it, I think it, it really was Carl Sagan, and I think it's been attributed to uh, Christopher Hitchens, where he says extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If like we agree in the scientific community uh, community that this is extraordinary, then the onus is actually on you to present the information. So it's okay to treat it with a little bit of disrespect or to joke, as long as it doesn't completely uh, be dismissive to the person. Yeah, and un- unfortunately, that's not the way; those aren't the rules society plays by. Those are the rules that science plays by. Yeah. You know, if if you were to try to publish a paper and make the claim uh, that vegetables are actually the cause of 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 the the primary cause of mortality in the modern world, um, you wouldn't be able to publish that paper because there is simply not the evidence to back up that claim, right? Yeah. But if you want to put that on a TikTok and make it make it go viral, 
you just need the formula that I mentioned earlier. And this actually shows that basically the way it operates in science is the opposite of the way it works in, in the information age. And this is, I want to bring up uh, what you people probably heard of is the, uh, the Brandolini's law, or also known as the bullshit asymmetry principle. It's not really a principle or a law. This is just basically an internet adage that was coined about 10 years ago now in 2013. So this is how long this has been a thing, right? Dealing with it in the social media age. And it's simply the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than needed to produce it. And this was coined and popularized by Alberto Brandolini, who's an Italian programmer. And he was inspired by uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, The, uh, the Social Psychologist, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, which is a great book. And um, most of it is accurate, although there's some of the replication crisis that impacted it, which Daniel Kahneman has addressed it directly. And there's some irony there, which I love. Um, but anyway, the, uh, I think this, this program was, was just referring to primarily in politics, how you have these things that get repeated and become talking points. And even though the facts are easy to find and they can be easily refuted, the amount of effort someone has to put in to refute it is way more than it takes to create it. Cause so, so let, let's talk about what is the barrier to make something go viral like this? Cause we've all seen it, it is a doctor. Uh, of any type, <laughs> uh, even if they're not trained in the area, um, who is a decent orator, having some anecdotes and needing one study of any type that sounds sciencey. Literally anything it could be published <laughs> in the worst journal. Um, maybe it's not even published data. Uh, it could be you know gray literature. It could be you know a random you know master's thesis that that it was in some it, that, like it literally does not matter if you have a place people can go and read it. And in isolation, it looks reasonably convincing or at least scientific enough to kind of confuse the person, but they read the conclusions and it's more or less what that person is saying and they can talk about it and they got a good mouth game. Um, now it's a thing, especially if they get platformed by someone else and almost that, that, that typically does happen because when something goes viral, that is something that then motivates uh, platformers, podcasters, other people on social media to be like, oh, that's hot right now. Let me get that on. That's in the space of health and fitness, right? That's all it takes. Um, to dismiss that myth, now you need to address an audience equally as large with the much less sexy thing of saying, oh, that's incorrect because of all these other studies. And, and what do you need to actively disprove something? If you want to be the evidence-based science communicator who disproves something, now I need a meta-analysis, multiple studies, all this stuff. And I can sit here and say as a scientist, look, this extraordinarily, extraordinary claim needs extraordinary evidence. But that's not the game that's being played online. The game that's being played is, was this enough to go viral and be convincing in isolation? Because that's the way things are taking. So now I have to go, oh God, like I'm going to give more air to this. And I'm going to have to go to relatively extraordinary lengths to give people all the context outside of us to understand why that's wrong. And now I'm coming to them and they've got a preconceived bias, right? So they, they've, they've already been convinced by something and now I'm, I'm second to the party, right? I'm already the guy who has a wrong belief and they've typically already inoculated uh, against me because all like, 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 we, like you brought up and like even that, that one-star review said, like the anti-establishment stuff, these are typically people, they have a contrarian nature, they've been burned in some way, they feel like they've been burned by, by what is it, the, 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 the traditional view, right? And they see conflict of interest, they see funding, they see governments involved, they see corporations involved, pick your, your evil, big, shadowy thing. Uh, and, and they're going to be immediately opposed to that. And that is also part of the formula. We had Ben House on talking yeah, about uh -huh. how if you, you hook into that, then you can get people riled up quite easily. And that's how we see, you know, populist politics go all the time, right? Drain the swamp or whatever. And, and, and you can leverage that. Um, you, you can, you can steal people's distrust, frustration and uh, disillusionment and turn it into, and galvanize it into, into action and political will or, uh, political beliefs or religious beliefs or nutrition beliefs, which share a lot of ground. So I think that's a really, really uphill mountain to climb. And Alan Flanagan is someone we've talked about as well. He made that really great Instagram post about how. The biggest issue here is not the people, the Instagram followers, the Instagram and their followers, the like the fitness influencers, 
for the people who are, you know, maybe writing that review, it is actually the doctors. Yeah. Like the people who, who have that first level of authority, who have the education to speak in this way. Um, and for whatever reason, either, like I said, coming by their bias honestly, or because they're trying to manipulate an audience and sell things, um, or just gain popularity by being controversial, which is a pathway to, to money and power in the end anyway, those people are, are who he gets really frustrated with. And, and I think Alan would admit this and we both believe this about him. We'd, we'd tell him like he can come across as pretty smug sometimes, but it's absolutely directed at, at those people because he knows what they're doing. He yeah. knows they should know better. And he knows that they're doing the harm because a random, like celebrities, yeah, they can have some impact just because of the volume of followers they have. Someone with a great physique, yeah, they can also have an impact. But I really do think it pales in comparison to the person who has the social credibility of being a PhD or a doctor who's then attacking the thing that they, they used to be a part of. Like, hey, I am a doctor. I know what's wrong with the medical establishment. All right, I was a researcher. I am a researcher. I know what's wrong here. And here's the real truth that they don't want you to have. That is something that a celebrity or a uh, someone with a great physique just just can't do. They do. They can't get that same hook. Um, they're going to be talking to people who already are not that interested in science. So so like, you never need to worry about people like Food Babe or you know, a, just a guy with a great physique, like they're, they're annoying and they're frustrated and they do perpetuate quote unquote bro science and all this stuff, but it never takes root in the rational, broader community of people who are interested in science and thinking about things logically, because we know that those audiences are just kind of, you know, they're all cult of personality based and, and those can only have a cult like following, even if it's a pretty large one, you know, like Goop can only do so much damage. Like you have to already have someone who is like, oh, I don't believe in doctors. And for some reason, I really like Gwyneth Paltrow and I'm interested in these things. And I'm probably not a very skeptical person. And honestly, a month later, I'll be following some other random trend. Like that's not typically who science communicators can reach. So it's kind of like a, this is a zero sum game anyway. But when we're talking about people who are buying a book by a doctor on nutrition, it is our audience. Yeah. And they're being subverted and we could reach them, but now we're up against Brandolini's law and it's so much harder to do because they've essentially been inoculated against us. And that's why the approach that I take when it does come up and I do decide to address it is to unemotionally and non-judgmentally to the person asking the question, refute it with the scientific context quickly and firmly because I'm actually doing the same thing. I'm inoculating everyone else who might be listening towards A, taking it seriously, and B, buying into it so that if they do get exposed to it later, they know, oh, I, I, I see this bait and switch. I've seen this before. This is not new. Um, and I'm glad I, you know, even though I didn't care about the, the carnivore diet when Eric brought it up, and it, yeah, he, didn't, he didn't make it something that I thought could be a viable option, which I think is an, an important error not to take when you are steel manning something, which I do, I, and I've said many times, uh, the principle of charity, steel manning, that is the way you approach uh, things that you don't agree with. Um, but be aware when you're doing that with something that you don't agree with that has potential harm and is a fringe belief uh, that you need to do it in a slightly different way, as I described. And I think, I think that's my best answer to your overall question. And, and what do we do about this um, at this stage? Because it is a very tough one. And there's people who write about it, think about it and struggle with it on a day-to-day -day basis in our space. Eric, two things. One, now people are wondering, why did we title this episode all about the carnivore diet? And well, my friends, <laughs> it was it was to get the clicks. And two, what I shudder to think about is not the looming, you know, dread of Cthulhu um, for he shall rise. It is the simple fact that if they were to dig not even deep into us, they would be able to refute everything you said not by the content of what you said, but me potentially being a liability by having one of the slogans of my channel be eat your vegetables. So I clearly have been compromised. You're associated with me. Big Broccoli has already bought my ass years ago. And now, of course, just, just by association, we know you're compromised too. So when I would say eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your fucking vegetables, they're like, Right, right there. He's he's trying to tell you guys he was there indoctrinating you. So I I love I love what you said, and I think the people if they didn't know 
my conflict of interest would have bought into that. But now we got ourselves in like a brinksmanship here with kind of some of the pro carnivore diet people. Yeah, I think there's a space we can expand into. It'll require a little bit of rebranding. Um, I don't think you need to spend too much time on it. Just say the word meat and then just kind of have that. <laughs> eat your meat. meat. Eat the your bulls. meat. The eat bulls. your meat, you know, and then uh, no one will even notice. <laughs> meat a bulls. <laughs> meat a bulls. Yeah, we just, it's very poorly edited. Now, uh, okay, I thought uh, fantastic. Let us move on now to the other topic, something comparatively... Far less controversial, stretch-mediated hypertrophy, uh, right, in the grand scheme of things. Eric's going to explain to you folks why basically those that do lengthen partials are really just lazy. It's an ego mechanism. They're compensating by lifting more weight and not going through a full range of motion. And the science is going to bear that out. So, Eric, take it away, my friend. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a new fringe idea uh, that that not training with a full range of motion, it's caught on fire because some quote unquote doctors, uh-huh. actually Milo Wolf is a PhD candidate, doesn't even have his doctorate yet. And he's going on podcasts, prominent ones like Iron Culture, don't know if you've heard of it, uh-huh. Revive Stronger. And he's running around talking about this fringe idea. And I guarantee you, he's going to come out with an ebook on how to do partial range of motion training soon. So this is the same bait and switch. Lengths and partials, stretch mediated hypertrophy, it's the new carnivore diet of niche training for extremely serious bodybuilders. It's a thing. Um, and uh, and you should have seen this coming. No, but in all, in all seriousness, like, this is an interesting one yeah. because this is a, uh, a belief that is forming based upon evidence that is counter to the traditional wisdom in the evidence-based community. And I think it's really interesting for that reason. Yep. Um, but it is essentially just us understanding on a more mechanistic level, but not fully formed, uh, like what is going on with full range of motion training? And then once we understand that, taking it a little bit further. So this isn't a new idea. We've talked about this before in Iron Culture. And um, it is the idea uh, that the position where your muscle is most, length- most lengthened is an underload and being trained and providing some tension is the portion of the range of motion that's doing the majority of the stimulus for hypertrophy. And this is a a growing body of research right now. And in the most recent issue of Mass that just came out on the 1st of May, I kind of tackled this from two different angles. I did a research brief specifically looking at uh, Warnicke and colleagues' most recent study. This is like a very prolific group led by Warnicke. I'm almost positive this is all part of a PhD um, where they've been looking at long static stretching. Like y'all remember when I was wearing the boot, which I'm, I'm done wearing now, but, and we're in the process of writing up that, that case study of me. Um, but Warnicke is where we got that idea from. And he was the first to show, uh, him and his group that just simply doing an extreme stretch, long duration, high frequency, high intensity, eight out of 10 stretch pain, um, on the calves resulted in pretty robust hypertrophy. And then a bunch of other research came out of that. Um, the most recent one they did is what I wrote the brief on, and that is Warnicke and colleagues, 2023 comparison to the effects of long lasting static stretching and hypertrophy training on maximal strength, muscle thickness, and flexibility in the plantar flexors, which are the calves. So this is a really, really cool study that Warnicke did because it's not just looking at recreationally trained or relatively untrained people stretching and seeing an effect. It's comparing two groups of these people, one of them stretching and one of them just doing your traditional calf hypertrophy training. And there's also a control group and comparing the effects. So I wrote a research brief on that. And then I also wrote a full article, uh, which I titled long muscle length partials are looking better and better, uh, where I reviewed the most recent study by Cassiano. And this is also on calves. So it speaks to the quality of Omar and my friendship that I could review two calf training uh, studies in mass and that we're still here today. So our bond is stronger than his biases. So I think you can believe uh, what we said about uh, the carnivore diet, if he can, if he can get past that. So uh, that study is titled uh, "Greater Gastrocnemius Muscle Hypertrophy After Partial Range of Motion Training Performed at Long Muscle Lengths." Gastrocnemius is the uh, one of the calf muscles. It's the one that's more prominent. The soleus sits underneath it. And uh, what they did in Cassiano and colleagues is they had uh, two groups, or actually three groups, uh, compared doing calf raises on a leg press. Um, one of them was doing just the bottom portion of the range of motion. So from being into dorsiflexion 
till their foot was neutral. So uh, their their foot was like perpendicular to their tibia. Uh, that's the, the initial range of motion group. One is doing a full range of motion calf raise with their foot on the leg press. And then the last group is just going from that neutral position of the foot being parallel to the tibia or the shin to just doing full extension. So kind of like the half. Uh, so two half range of motion groups, the, the final portion of it when the muscle is shorter, uh, the first portion when the muscle is staying more elongated, and then the full range of motion group. And so before I talk about the findings, I think we need to, to kind of go through where this body of research has come from and what's really interesting. The first time I was really aware that this whole topic popped up onto the scene, Omar, was actually a research review uh, by Schoenfeld and colleagues, if I recall correctly. It might have been Gurdjieff and Schoenfeld. No, it's Schoenfeld and Gurdjieff. And that is, uh, it was just basically a systematic review that looked at range of motion. And when you looked at all the individual studies, and if you listen to kind of the evidence-based community's overall take, it was, hey, you get greater hypertrophy doing full range of motion training. And I think it was strengthened by the fact that there's probably some, some moral feelings about full range of motion training. Like it's more hardcore, you're doing the full range, you know, it, it makes you like, we, we see doing a partial range of motion is, is like ego lifting, like you're doing a half squat or not coming all the way down on bench. So you're, you're trying to cheat. You're, you're not really getting in there and doing the hard salt of the earth labor of training, right? So like it's bolstered by all this and you can see that reflected in YouTube comments. How dare you not hit depth? You know, you're clearly a terrible human, all that stuff. Um, but anyway, there was this, I would say overall supported by the evidence, evidence-based belief that full range of motion training produced more hypertrophy than partial range of motion training. And while accurate, an interesting thing pointed out in the systematic review by Schoenfeld and, Kyle, Schoenfeld and Gurdjieff titled The Effects of Range of Motion on Muscle Development During Resistance Training Interventions, a systematic review, was that this wasn't always found. It was found with the right kind of full range of motion training compared to the right kind of partial range of motion training. It's specifically when people are doing partials where they're cutting out uh, the bottom portion or the initial range of motion where the muscles elongated, yeah, then full range of motion training is better. But it wasn't always observed. So if you had a uh, a protocol where they're doing like a mid-range partial or an initial range of motion partial, that wasn't the case. And one comment that they had in the discussion was that, hey, you know, we may be seeing an effect of full range of motion training enhancing hypertrophy specifically because they're training in a position where the muscles are longer. So it's not the greater range of motion per se, but rather because full range of motion includes training at long muscle lengths, while partials often, but not always, exclude a long muscle length. So that's kind of where this started. And we started to hear these kind of rumblings and, and the people who like to have slightly contrarian views that the rest of the evidence-based community hasn't jumped on first are like, yeah, is it full range of motion training? Or... Is it because they're doing long muscle lengths? I bet you long muscle length partials are better. And some people are like, oh, this is a new idea. I don't like it, you know? So these are some deep cuts if you're in certain areas on the internet and looking at Instagram posts. But I noticed them and I thought it was really interesting. So I started to dig into this. Um, I would say where I started to get a little more intrigued and interested was when they started examining the same range of motion, but manipulating muscle length. So there's a couple of studies, probably one of the more prominent ones, uh, I want to say is by Mao and colleagues. And what they did was they compared full range of motion hamstring training and manipulated muscle length. And we've talked about this study before. It's uh, greater hamstrings, muscle hypertrophy, but similar damage protection after training at long versus short muscle lengths. And that came out in 2021. And what they did is they just very simply compared seated hamstring curls to lying hamstring curls. So both of them, equal range of motion about the knee joint, the same degrees of, uh, of, of change in range of motion, of knee flexion, right? But one group is in a seated position, so like a sit and reach. So it's actually putting the hamstring on greater stretch, and the other group is lying down. And since the sartorius, which is that long strap-like muscle, which is pretty cool in the front relaxed, and it's kind of just on the inside of your quads, that actually attaches at the front of the hip, um, and it's also a weak knee flexor that's actually a little longer when you're in a lying position. So the cool thing this study found was greater hamstrings growth in the seated hamstring curl, but greater sartorius growth in the lying hamstring curl. So this perfectly aligns with the idea of, hey, in both of these types of uh, exercises, seated and lying hamstring curls, we're getting the same range of motion about the knee. So range of motion is equal. What's different? Muscle length. And what do we see? In both cases, sartorius and hamstrings group, 
when the muscle is longer, greater hypertrophy. And this actually gives some indirect support to that kind of discussion point in Gurdjieff and Schoenfeld's systematic review, right? Um, so at this point, if you'd asked me just, I would say two years ago, hey, uh, do you think if we started to do partial range of motion training at a long muscle length? So, you know, if you're not sure exactly what I'm talking about, maybe you got that calf uh, explanation, but let's say you're doing leg press and you just came half the way up. So you're not fully locking out your knees, you're just in the bottom part of the leg press. Or let's say you're just doing the bottom part of a bench press. Or let's say you're just doing the first half of a, a lat pull down or a row. You're keeping all of your efforts in of, of that set with the muscle being in a longer position. You're not doing that, that last bit of it, what is often sometimes seen as a peak contraction or sometimes seen as the point where it feels hardest or the pump is hardest or for certain exercises like the back or like a dumbbell lateral raise where the tension is highest, it's also where the muscle is the shortest. So it feels like the point where you maybe get the most pump. It feels like the point where it's the most challenging. And it's for certain exercises, this idea can be a little like, but that's the hardest part of the rep, you know? So you get mixed messages from, from, from kind of the anecdotal side of how it feels and what people think about it uh, and the importance of the quote unquote hard portion that really just has to do with the strength curve of a given range of motion. But nonetheless, that's what the idea of a long muscle length partial or a length and partial is, is only performing that initial part of the range of motion where the muscle that you're trying to train is in a longer position. If you'd asked me, what do I think would be better, full range of motion training or long muscle length partials, I would have said they're probably going to be the same because we've got this data that indicates perhaps that's why full range of motion and training is beneficial. So both of them include that longer muscle length position, so they should be equal. But lo and behold, now we've actually had four studies that have compared doing a long muscle length partial to a full range of motion training. And two of them very clearly and one a little less clearly have found that the long muscle length partials actually outperformed full range of motion training and one actually found them to be similar. So those four studies are not only Cassiano, the most recent one, but there was also a few others. Uh, Goto and colleagues, they compared partial range of motion, um, I believe tricep extensions, um, and those were done in the mid-range versus a full range of motion. And the mid-range group, their average muscle length was a little bit longer than the other, and they saw greater triceps growth. Uh, that's kind of the one that's partially in favor of it because it was a mid-range versus a typical traditional, uh, well, not traditional yet, but typically how I would describe doing a long muscle length partial. Um, the one that found no significant difference was by Workhausen and colleagues. They used a leg press looking at the quads. And then the other one that was also clearly in favor, in addition to Cassiano, which I'll talk about in a second, was Pedrosa and colleagues, where they had leg extensions done. And the group that did just the bottom portion of the leg extension when the quad was in a longer position outperformed the other groups, including the full range of motion group. Uh, and to not you know bury the lead, what happened in this Cassiano study, there was actually almost twofold an increase in muscle thickness greater in the gastrocnemius in the group that was doing the initial range of motion calf raise compared to the full range of motion. And there was only very small changes in the group doing the shortened partials, if you will. So this does surprise me. Like I said, go back two years, Omar, and you asked me, hey, what do you think is better? I'd say they're probably the same because they both contain the important part. But what this body of research is starting to show is that there is effort and there's fatigue and there are a finite, there's a finite amount of fatigue and effort you can put forth in a workout. So if you're putting a lot of effort into that final part of that range of motion where you're getting a less stimulative effect, it's changing what some might call that kind of stimulus to fatigue ratio. Uh -huh. You're expending a lot of effort in a less productive part for hypertrophy, which is an important distinction. Um, and if you were to just perform the most stimulative part, you're probably getting a little more quote unquote bang for your buck. That's not to say you're also not getting a little more fatigue because that kind of typically comes hand in hand with stimulus, but it's probably a better ratio, if you will, or just a better gamble, quote unquote. Um, and, you know, it does seem that is the case. And we started to get a hint at this about a year ago, um, recently published in the International Journal of Strength Conditioning, uh, our very own Milo Wolf, as well as Dr. Pack and James Steele we've had on, as well as Fisher and Schoenfeld, they published a meta-analysis, partial versus full range of motion resistance training, uh, a systematic review of meta-analysis. Really good. It's open access. I encourage people to read it. 
It's primarily a comparison of full versus partial range of motion training. Um, but they had one specific sub-analysis where they looked at, at the time, the only three studies that existed, this is prior to Cassiano, and they actually calculated the effect size of shortened partials, lengthened partials, both against full range of motion training. And shortened partials absolutely got destroyed by full range of motion training, but lengthened partials, based on the three studies that were out, so Workhausen, um, Goto, as well as Pedrosa, prior to Cassiano, they had a 0.28 effect size, which is a small effect size in favor of length and partials. So that was the first time I'm like, oh, it's slightly better, right? Now, the thing is, is anytime you have an area of research where we're just talking about a handful of studies, and that is a really, really important point, is while I'm pretty convinced at this stage that I think length and partials are most likely to be better than full range of motion training and they're worth experimenting with, because I think worst case scenario, they're certainly not worse. There's no studies that lean towards full range of motion training being better than length and partials. So you want to play with this, you want to experiment with it. We'll talk about the applied nature. I'm sure you'll have questions about that. Go for it. Um, but it is possible that the next four studies come out and show no significant difference, and we're back to a smaller effect size. But right now, we went from a 0.28 small effect size to now seeing Cassiato finding double the gains in the group doing the length and partials versus full range of motion training. And while I haven't done a formal meta-analysis on this. If you throw that, it's 25% of, of the number of studies in that analysis, we're probably looking at that small effect size approaching moderate, uh, which is an arbitrary kind of number, but it basically means that it's it's a lot clearer of an effect uh, that, that length and partials are probably better than full range of motion training for hypertrophy. So I know a bit of a monologue, Omar, I'm going to let you jump in, but I think there are a few points left to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, is What does this look like in practice? Does this change what we know about strength and specificity? And how confident can we be? And what do we do about this data, uh, which 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 I can all cover? All right. This is very interesting because rarely does it happen, especially with modern exercise science, that a, an entire area of topic is re-examined and there are potentially new fruitful conclusions that can have broader implications for those that are interested in them. Um, I want to quickly, because I do want to talk about the applications from a handful of years ago to now, the, you know, evidence-based emphasis on based uh, person would say, oh, okay, uh, it looks like the lengthened position can elicit greater hypertrophy. Well, if we're doing a full range of motion, let's maybe bias that range of motion and make sure it includes the lengthened position or potentially emphasize it. Why, why then, if it's an either or, like if we're just talking pure binary, why then would we need to do just lengthen partials? But then more evidence comes out that, hey, this this potential uh, uh, lengthened partial can be quite beneficial. Then when you talk about the stimulus to fatigue ratio, the extra shorter range of motion, the shortened position, well, not that you're uh, necessarily throwing away effort that you're doing, but it, that effort can then be applied better in this lengthened position. Oh, wait a second. We should then be incorporating it. I want to know, uh, Eric, because for myself, I have done an ethnographic survey of lifters over the last 10 to 15 years. And what I mean by uh, when I say that, I've just been speaking with lifters and I've passed a moral judgment on them that those that do partials are just bad people. So I'm going to need some, you did a remarkable job. I'm going to need some convincing here that I want to know what the current body of evidence, when we talk about general applications, are we saying to you still do the full range of motion and we say full range of motion things like on the squat, but we know the length of position, okay, the bottom with the squat, cool, that you want to make sure that you're truly doing full ROM and then you're also including length and partials as well? Or are we almost at this point where if we want to bring up, let's say, a legging area or we want to emphasize a particular muscle group that we should put even greater emphasis on length and partials more than full realm. Like where are on this pendulum, let's say that two years ago, to your point, Eric, we were, okay, lengthening partials, very intriguing, potentially elicit greater hypertrophy. Well, just make sure when you do full range of motion, you kind of really target that and if anything, emphasize it to like, hey, Omar, we should actually be considering lengthened partials on their own. Where are we on the spectrum? Because all these studies as the nature uh, is, as it requires, it's either or where it's like, okay, so it's full ROM versus a lengthened partial. But in terms of application, where are we now on the spectrum in terms of incorporating it? Yeah. And, and there are actually some data on uh, mixing it up. Cool thing about that Pedrosa study, I, I summarized it very briefly. And I said that the group that grew the most in the quads was the one doing that initial range of motion yep. group. 
But there was another group that did the top half and the bottom half, but they didn't do full. Yep. And they were like the second best. Yep. Um, and, you know, if you look at the actual numbers, they're not clearly worse than just doing the length and partial, but they're clearly better than the full range of motion or, or just the uh, shortened partial. So kind of the question is, is, is there something to be said for, like, are we leaving something on the table if we don't get that full range of motion? Yeah. And one thing that has been reported a few different times in this body of research, and I do mean a few, uh, not like many times, is that you see differences in regional hypertrophy when you do shortened partials. So uh, if I say distal and proximal, all I mean is that uh, further from the, the origin of a muscle versus closer to it. So a proximal portion of the muscle, if we're talking about the bicep, would be closer to your, your shoulder, right? Um, and the distal would be closer to your elbow, okay? Uh, and for the quadricep, the proximal would be closer to your hip, the distal would be closer to your knee, okay? So interesting thing that we find is that in shortened partials, so training at a, like just doing the very last portion of a leg extension or just doing the very top of a curl, it seems to produce similar proximal growth, but far less distal growth. Uh, and training with a lengthened partial, just training at the end range of motion, seems to produce both and overall greater hypertrophy, which is comparable or better than long muscle, uh, than, than full range of motion training. So we haven't ever seen a study where you see that shortened partial gets you more proximal growth, but it is intriguing to see that we don't do a fantastic job, all these studies are using ultrasound, of necessarily examining like the most proximal and most distal. We don't have these perfectly great analyses of them, although we do have some studies that look at overall volume with MRI. They're, they're the minority, and this is a small body of research. One thing I do want to actually give a shout out, there was a great discussion of this topic um, on the Revive Stronger mm -hmm. podcast recently with Mike Isratel, Pack, and Milo Wolf. And recently I was on the N1 Education podcast uh, with uh, Kasim Hansen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we had a good discussion about this. And I think there is some, there's like a lot that we don't know right now, Omar. And I think that this is potentially could be influ Like, I do think we need more research where we take a, a, a more holistic look at more regions of the muscle. And I would love to see some more studies uh, w w with, with MRI and more global metrics of muscle volume to make sure this is the case. But we, right now, all the data does suggest that you're not losing anything by doing a length and partial and you are gaining something. Or at worst, like the Workhausen study, it's the same. So I think it's a very good bet right now to say, you know what, if I'm specifically for a muscle group that might be lagging, I might try doing a lot more of my work in the length and partial position. Um, if my goals are primarily hypertrophy, I would have no problem with someone slowly transitioning towards primarily doing length and partials um, rather than seeing it as an adjunct to full range of motion training. I think how you do that is really important though. On average, training at longer muscle lengths is going to produce higher tension, is going to produce more muscle damage. And you might find that the amount of volume that you need to do benefit from and the amount of fatigue you get is different when you go from full range of motion training to length and partials, which is an important point. So I would generally advise not just like, don't just flip the table over and be like, everything I do is going to be a length and partial. I would say take, you know, one exercise per muscle group and swap it out for something like that. And then wait until you adapt, wait until you're not, you know, getting really sore after those initial training sessions, see how it goes, give it some time. Uh, and then, you know, consider doing that uh, again with another exercise or another muscle group. So I would, I would taper it and phase it in. Another thing I would say is that I think exercise selection is very important. Uh -huh. Squats are not a good exercise for this. You know, like whether you hit failure on purpose or an accident, remember you're, there's a few exercises where the length and position is already the hardest, right? Like most pressing and most leg exercises, it's the hardest point of the free weight exercises specifically. So doing squats and only coming halfway up, whoa, that, that could go bad, right? We can all think about that. Bench press, same thing. But a leg press, if you can set the pins or the stopper or a Smith machine, where if you hit failure, you can actually still exit and you're not getting crushed, or a chest press machine. All these are great options. Machines are great options. Cables are great options. And an interesting thing, and uh, I've heard Kasim talk about this, is 
we it's actually very difficult to measure hypertrophy in like the lats or the delts. And those are typically muscle groups when you look at bodybuilders that are much more likely to lag on average. You know, like I've talked about T taper versus a V taper and people struggle to bring up, bring up their back. Um, when you're a full range of motion adherent, you are probably maybe more likely to be negatively influenced by that on back exercises where it's hardest at the shortened part. Cause you're thinking, all right, well, I'm only going to count a rep if I can get this bar all the way in my torso, or if I can get my chin above the bar or whatever. And to do that, it's like, if you were to ask somebody if, how many partial chin-ups could you get versus full chin-ups? And I've actually seen this in the military. It might double the number of reps you get. But at the cost, just like you were saying and summarizing so well, of doing the portion that is probably the least helpful for hypertrophy. And an interesting thing I've observed is that, you know, sometimes we just kind of poo-poo the anecdotes of IFBB pros. But IFBB pros do like selective types of partials. And that's something I've noticed. You ever watch an IFBB pro, not all of them, but some of them uh, doing like dips, they don't come up all the way. Chin-ups, they don't come up all the way. Um, bench press, they kind of stay at the bottom and don't lock out. Leg press, they typically don't lock out all the way. Squats, they, they, they stop short of locking out. They might be doing it for the quote unquote wrong reason. Like they're kind of have this constant tension. They want the pump and all that, but they're naturally gravitating towards doing partials or almost full range of motion, but not quite, that is cutting off, not the lengthened position, but the shortened position. And I think one thing, and Berto brought this up in one of his vlogs, I think it's a really good point. You know, sometimes we take the position of, I don't want to pay attention to what these guys using a lot of drugs are doing because it is heavily confounded by the fact that they're using drugs. But at a certain level, what we're seeing is that, like steroids do grow muscle indiscriminately, just by taking them. We have that from like the Bassin study where they had like, you know, 600 milligrams lifting or nothing. Yep. And, uh, and or, or 600 milligrams and not lifting. And the group that was doing 600 milligrams and not lifting outperformed the lifting group. Like that, that's, that's real. But if you think about the type of growth that was probably observed, like if you were to look at it, it would probably be equally distributed, proportional. And there's probably some lean body mass growing that is not actually muscle mass. Because anything with an and androgen receptor that can grow and will hypertrophy will from from steroids. And you see facial structure changes in people who, who are on gear and stuff like that. So consider that. So if a bodybuilder who wants proportionate development is taking anabolics and training a specific muscle group, there's a synergistic effect. And that muscle group will grow with a much greater signal to noise ratio than a natural bodybuilder. So if they are kind of finding these anecdotal things, like, oh, I'm doing these partials. And it's specifically, they started trying this new technique to make this one muscle group grow. They might be right. Because in a 12-week period of blasting gear and doing this thing to try to target a single muscle group, it's either going to work or they're not going to see a change. So if you see a group of anecdotes collectively falling around a certain type of way of performing an exercise in IFBB pros, I think it's worth paying a little bit of attention. I'm not saying this is like a study or anything like that. So I think it's really intriguing that you see some of those collections of anecdotes and it makes me kind of rethink some of the judgments I've had on some of these partials. Like you will also see this, the big jack dude on gear who's only doing a half squat and they're yelling and it's clearly because they want to lift more weight or like rack pulls like that. These, these things make no sense, right? They're, they're literally just, I'm, I want to be a big animal and make noise and record a video of lifting more plates on the bar. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about high level athletes who happen to be, you know, on, on a ton of gear who have collectively kind of found the same anecdotes and they also happen to be lengthened partials. I just think that's an interesting thing. It's not strong support, but it's interesting. So I think you can definitely include it. Um, and I think the muscle group specificity of the delts and the lats where you, with traditional exercises like a lat pull down or a row or a dumbbell lateral raise, they have actually always been shitty exercises when you think about it from this perspective. A dumbbell lateral raise doesn't get hard until you're at the very top. Um, switching that to a cable lateral raise is kind of that first step based upon this data. You go, oh shoot, I can actually have tension in a longer position. And then the next step you might do if you're really not seeing much growth in, the, in, in your delts is, and I'm only going to come halfway up and I'm going to spend all my time in that. And oh, then I'm going to cross my arm across my body or behind my back to even get a greater stretch on my delt. And I, in Berto's personal experience, here's another kind of just anecdotal observation when he started adapting all of his back training 
towards being in a lengthened position and trying to find more ways to put tension in a lengthened position. So overloading the first part, not completing the full range of motion, uh, you know, and kind of just having this whole worldview and perspective. He saw a very late stage change in his physique that was very noticeable in his back from 2017 when he last competed to last year. And that was the biggest thing that changed in his approach. So I think that we have a convergence of things happening here. And when you think about the traditional exercises like squats and presses, they're already good exercises. Squats are hardest in the hole. Bench press is hardest off your chest. You don't, there's probably less of an opportunity to really make transformative changes to a, a quote unquote advanced technique when we're talking about pressing exercises and most leg exercises, because just the nature of the exercises that we typically have said are great. But I think there are some exercises where that is not the case, um, like back exercises and delt exercises. This is another great point that Kasim brought up and where the anecdotes fall are typically for those type of muscle groups where, hey, this is something to play with because you've probably never actually exposed those muscles to a high degree of tension in those lengthened position and then done most of your volume in that position. And I think that's probably where the, the application is because in my experience, like lagging backs is one of the more common things in bodybuilding. And when you see people with lagging uh, legs, it is often a structural issue or just I never trained it, right? Um, there are some people who just have lagging, you know, legs cause they, they have lagging legs and that's just them, but it's, it's not like a pervasive issue, you know, like most bodybuilding coaches I know, they have a, a series of steps that they have tried and, and, and they use, and they're very similar for, oh, I've got the client with a, with bad back and then, okay, we're going to use straps. We're going to try this. We're going to try to get a length. Like it's, it's very similar and it's all helping them develop a better mind muscle connection and get more efficient with their training. Um, and another observation, like how often do you hear you need twice as much pulling depressing, yeah. right? That was, uh, I think that's one of the polyquinisms and that was sold as a shoulder health thing. But I think that might just be because you're not getting much muscle damage from the, the delt and back work because it's not very challenging to lengthen position. So to kind of compensate for the fact that on a per rep and per set basis, you're getting less stimulus you might need to be doing these, these, these additive types of, uh, you know, approaches. So, okay, well, if I'm only getting half the effectiveness from these exercises, which don't put my attention at a long length, we got to do more back work, you know, and most people feel like they can recover from more lateral raises and lat pull downs and rows than they can from bench, for example. So again, I, I don't want to sound, make it sound like these are my own personal observations. These are actually things that brought up in those those the two podcasts and so big shout out to Casim from n1 and also shout out to milo wolf uh, who's been doing a lot of think, thinking about this but i think they're really worth sharing and the data is is what really tipped me over so personal thing that you should know omar most of my hypertrophy training right now is long muscle length partials eric i will say i knew it was something serious when in a private converse, a conversation we're just talking about training and you were telling me how you started incorporating length and partials. And you said, Omar, for yourself, I mean, there's a lot that you need to do about it. You should really consider, like, trust me, Omar, you should think about this. The one, the one exactly to your point that I found, and this is exactly to the point, that just because something seems intuitive doesn't make it necessarily so. And in fact, yeah. it often can be counterintuitive. Using the back, I think the back is the best example. As we all know, we're fundamentally a lot weaker at the end range of motion as we pull it in and on like whatever like the uh, um, cedar row on a pull-up so on so on. you don't a rep does not count unless you break it to the top unless your chin goes past the bar or when it comes to the row it's considered sometimes bad form if you're not completing the full range of motion and so you'd actually use less weight overall because once again you want to ensure right full rom all of the things being equal it, it, it's a very good thing well it must be difficult because there's some sort of mechanism there within the back musculature and same idea with the delt that that extra range of motion really is where you get that peak contraction that must be a good thing and now with the mounting potential you know evidence to the uh, contrary that's just like uh, other lengthened partials that really you should be focusing on loading and going through that lengthened partial position that challenges that very notion that many of us would have held that, oh, wait a second, like on that seated row, you mean to tell me that you should use whatever the weight that is necessary and whatever the established, you know, partial range of motion would elicit greater hypertrophy than really making sure you get that peak contraction at the end. 
and that I I love that the idea that something can come in the face of uh, something that you would hold to be generally true because it seems once again from your training that oh this is so the question I have for you though uh, Eric and I think this is one of those uh, topics where people will now bring up like the partials and of course I get it to overcome uh, some of the tradition of the way that we regard training and like people that do good training in quotations. Uh, typically they do a full range of motion and they emphasize the entirety of the range of motion to not skip out on any par uh, part of it. How do we define then now the lengthened partial ROM? Because I think for some people now, okay, they're like, Eric, like, yeah, I got it. You like, you brought, you brought those damn calf, uh, uh exercises. You brought them even the hamstrings, the sartorius. Okay. I am ready. And you spoke about, if we want to be cautious, subbing out one exercise for lengthened partials, one of kind of the counter uh, points I've seen raised is how can we standardize that where once again, people have a tendency because let's use the seated rows as an example, okay? Uh, with the seated row, I'm making up numbers here. Uh, you could do 150 for a set of 10, full range, in particular the peak contraction that really limits your strength. Well, now if we establish, let's say there's a, a full range of motion here and the length and partial would be emphasis on the length and position towards about 50% of what would be the full range of motion. So lengthen to about the 50%, so you're not bringing it all the way to your chest. We understand that. Well, now you're going from 150 to like 220 pounds or whatever the case, like I'm, again, just making up this example. But how do we standardize the partial because people will have a tendency, Erica, as we know, that if it's like the seated row, well, now we're overloading it, right? Because very likely we'll be using, I'm using just the back because that, that, that's the one that I think uh, we can all agree would probably be using a decent amount more weight. How do we standardize this length and partial if we are uh, wanting to incorporate it? Great question, Omar. And it actually brings up um, a couple of things and I'll, I'll divert and then I'll answer your question a little more, more directly. So, so the first one is, it makes you wonder about why is this working, right? Because you might you would ideally want a well-informed uh, mechanistic explanation as to what's the most appropriate ra range of motion to use. And, you know, at this stage, I think what is pretty clear, because length and partials are outperforming on average full range of motion training, is that it's not the act of getting into the longest muscle position, but it is kind of the area under the curve of high tension being delivered at that longer position. So if it's just simply getting there, then we would just do like a pause and like a, you know, like a pause and lengthen position, or we could do the DC stretching afterwards, or we could, you know, just try to think about really trying to get even more range of motion in that lengthened position. And, and that would be what's, what's really making the magic. But the fact that lengthened partials are better than full range means it's not just the exposure to that longest position. It is the time spent there and probably the degree of tension developed right? Because like you said, if you're doing rows with full range, yeah, you're including that lengthened position, but the strength curve is such that it's actually quite easy. Even when you hit a 10 RPE by touching that cable to your chest, you probably could do another 10 reps if you just did half the range. Um, so you're like at a, like a two to three RPE for the first half or first third, right? So that's something to consider. The second thing to consider is actually the second study I was going to talk about, which is Warnicky. Now, Really interesting. The big picture findings was that people who were using the calf boot for an hour per day, seven days per week, for eight weeks, got the same growth as people who were training with calf raises. But the important thing to realize is the calf raise group was doing far less total work when you think about it. Right. Okay. So they were training three days per week, not every day for an hour, but simply doing a hypertrophy protocol of five sets. So they're just doing five sets of 15 to 20 to failure on a calf raise in, in, on a leg press. So we're talking about spending 15 minutes three times per week for a total of 45 minutes. That's less than one of the calf stretching protocols to get a similar hypertrophy outcome. Not exactly the same either, but similar, right? So this, the, why am I bringing this up? This is sort of different, you know, the effect of static stretching, not doing a length and partial. Because we aren't sure of the exact mechanism, which makes length and partials better. But I will say that quote unquote, stretch mediated hypertrophy is probably part of it, but not the major part. Because if it was the primary mechanism by which a length and partial was enhancing hypertrophy, just being in that longer position and creating passive tension at a long muscle length, 
we wouldn't see a similar outcome between 15 minutes of calf raise training to seven hours per week of extreme stretching. Yeah. We would see a way better outcome for extreme stretching, right? So it's probably baked into there, but there are probably other effects and we don't know what they are. So it could be uh, active tension is, is more important than passive. What do I mean by that? I mean the actual process of contracting and having uh, costamers and lateral transmission of force getting transmitted across muscles versus just the tendon transmitting that force um, from being in a passively stretched position. It could be that you're creating more ischemia, so more of, uh, you know, basically a restriction of blood flow, a more hypoxic environment when you're training in a, long, a lengthened position and you're contracting. Um, it could be a number of factors. It could be something else entirely, and most likely it's multiple factors at once. But what we can say is that just the act of being in a stretch position, being in the longest position and creating uh, that, that, that kind of stretch, which you would get from either pausing or the DC style stretching or putting on the boot or just doing yoga or whatever, is part of it, but it's not the main part. So that's kind of inherent in us seeing that full range of motion training is inferior on average right now, based upon the data we have compared to that long muscle length training. So that brings us back to, okay, so what is going on here, right? We're not sure, but it's probably multiple mechanisms. And to go back to your question, which remind me what it was, because that'll tell me why I even said that. Yeah. So it's the idea of how do we standardize the partial range yes. of motion? So going back to your question of how, how do we decide when and where to stop? I think we probably don't want to leap to the conclusion of, let me just do the most stretch position and just do a little yeah. itty bitty tighter, tiny range of motion. Cause it's all about the quote unquote, stretch mediated hypertrophy. Um, that, that could be true and it might be different if you're doing active tension, but right now we're limited by what does the data tell us? Right. And if, uh, until more research comes out, basically what we're looking at is the bottom half or bottom third of the range of motion. The, the studies that we have, if we look at Pedrosa, if we look at Cassiano, and if we look at, actually Goto is kind of a, a slightly different one, but it does show that it's not about the end range of motion because they did a mid-range partial that on average, the the the, uh, the range of motion was, was deeper than the full range of motion group. It's probably about the area under the curve time spent at a longer length relative to being in a full range of motion. So it is probably not super, super, super important. And we're not at the point where we have solid data for me to say, yeah, absolutely. Doing the bottom third is better than the bottom half or doing the bottom two thirds is better. We just don't have that data. But we we do see is that in, in Pedrosa, and then in Cassiano, that doing the bottom third or the bottom half seem to be better. And I think this is a little more intuitive, and this is purely my anecdotal experience of having done a few months of this type of training now, that there are certain kind of body position landmarks and the point at which you start to feel the sticking point that really help you decide what range of motion should I use to be consistent. So for example, on pull downs and rows, essentially getting to that point when you're at a 90 degree angle with your elbow to your upper arm. Yeah. So you're doing a pull down until your, you know, your, your upper arm is parallel to the ground. You're doing a row until your, uh, your arm is perpendicular to the ground. That's pretty easy. Um, if you're doing say a lateral raise coming up to the midway point when your arm is about a 45 degree angle from your body, since you're so used to coming all the way up and you know what it's like to have your arm next to your side, I find it like I look at videos of myself lifting. I'm, I'm lifting with my wife, who's my training partner. I've trained with Berto while we're in Mexico. It's actually quite easy in most cases to be able to do a partial. Um, the only times it's not is when you have weird sticking points. Like sometimes on bench press, you have the bottom stick and you kind of have that top stick. Mm -hmm. You're not sure, should I be just below it or not? But I think, again, you can basically just go to that point when you're at like a 90. And, um, and you probably... Like I said, I don't think bench press is a great vehicle for this. And you probably want to have like be a little more flat back so you can get deeper and a more mid-range grip versus wide grip. Um, and if you're caring about performance, this is a different animal like specificity and strength, which we'll discuss in a second. But I think most of the time it's easier than you might expect. And with a little bit of experience doing just the bottom half of that range of motion is the easiest thing to track. It's an intuitive midway point between where you'd finish and where you start. And a lot of the times the strength curve or just the visual thing you're seeing as a lifter line up with being able to tell where that is and being pretty consistent. Um, and to give one more kind of tick in the box that that is probably the case, uh, the research right now that we're a multi-site data collection portion of that Milo Wolf is doing for his PhD, actually comparing a group 
doing a lot of exercises in a very applied setting in home with their own equipment, either doing length and partials or full range of motion. We're not having an issue with repeatability Mm -hmm. um, thus far. Um, We haven't actually started our group here yet, but Milo has, and his participants are not like, where's the end of the range of motion? So, and that hasn't been my experience either, that once you actually start trying this, it becomes reasonably intuitive to know where to stop. Yeah. Eric, that, that makes sense to me. To me, it's a similar argument that people would bring against a RP. It's like, but how do you actually know that you're at RP? Yeah. It's like, no, we could define this and test this because then we can test people like what is their max or like how many reps did they actually have left? It actually bears fruit that it's within a, a, a certainly an acceptable amount. I would assume uh, with uh, range of motion or partial range of motion that people can figure out, especially with landmarks or if you're doing like a pull-up, we have an external focus too. So like you have, on the seated row, like your own arm you're looking at, or on the pull-up, it's like, oh, like when my eye line meets whatever, like just at the bar instead of going over it, like I know that like that's my range of motion. So I I, I could see that. Uh, the question then, you said the next one, we're talking specifically now about mm. the big boys, the big girls, okay, hypertrophy, those that want to just get swole. Is there any applicability or is it only indirect as it relates then to strength? And we are talking now about the concept of, you know, it's kind of an open discourse of how much one wants to include. As you said, uh, for yourself, a lot of the training now does comprise uh, uh, in length and partials, but it's up to the person how much they want to incorporate. The whole conversation now as it relates to strength, I assume would completely change it, whereas you said specificity reigns supreme. But any good strength athlete especially when they only have competition, you know, a certain uh, block of preparation that's far more specific. And then they're much more generalized. And as you've been breaking down recently, as it relates to strength training, something that people might not understand is that the hyper-specific part, the act of doing the single or the movement to the competition standard is a thing that is most important to get stronger at those movements. But that still, that doesn't preclude the possibility of doing a wide variety of different things outside of that portion that is specific how would one incorporate, Eric, as someone who I would say has been a trailblazer in the strength community in terms of the way you set up training? My prediction is that it is still possible to do something, whether or not have any carryover of the of strength directly remains to be seen. But as it relates to someone getting yuckier, certainly talk to me, man. No, that's yeah, your 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 suppositions are correct. Um the strength, you're right, and performance in general, specificity does reign supreme. So if we want to see what's the immediate most direct way to enhance your strength um, or performance, you want to do something that's similar enough to it to have transfer, right? That's really what we're talking about is transfer. So for example, there are some studies that have found uh, quarter squats and half squats to be a little better than full range of motion squats for enhancing sprint performance and jump performance in some cases, not always. Um, And if you think about the joint angles that are involved in sprinting and jumping, you're typically not going to IPF legal depth. You know, that's it's a pretty deep, you know, like maybe in the starting blocks briefly, but you know, like it's, that's just not the position you're in, right? And we've got research going all the way back to the 80s. There's a foundational study um, by Kitai and Sale, the specificity of joint angle and isometric training. And it is isometric, which it means you're not actually moving, but they basically looked at all these different isometric positions at a joint and, and training at them. And they notice that you're only going to see strength get enhanced within, a, you know, like one position of that, the place you train. So let's say you're training every 10 degrees of knee extension. If you trained a whole lot of time at 40 degrees, if you're past 50 or underneath 30, you're seeing less transfer, a lot less transfer, right? So strength is specific to uh, movement patterns, joint angles, velocity, a lot of things. So that's why I say specificity reigns supreme when it comes to performance. And that's why you will see some schools of S&C and some approaches, they'll do special specific exercises, which are meant to mimic performance. And then we're just changing the loading demands and the velocity, you know, for, for maybe getting a certain other characteristics we want from the athlete at different times and phases. There's a whole kettle of fish that we could, we could get into there, but ultimately for the audience we're listening to, like if you're trying to enhance your bench press, the bench press variations you use are going to need to be close enough with maybe a specific focus on certain thing to transfer well. Like let's say you're you really struggle off your chest doing a pause bench press. There's there's an absolute logical argument for that, but you probably wouldn't want to cut off the end range of your bench press because you want to grow more pecs and tries. 
because now you're you're potentially trading something. You're using a vehicle that has not only the ability to grow those muscles and have some useful strength from hopefully having more contractile tissue, but also transferring the movement that your your sport performance, your sport discipline is a bench press. So is that the best vehicle for doing that? Maybe not. Maybe you do some partial range of motion, uh, like tricep extensions and flies, right? If it's purely for the goal of enhancing hypertrophy, that's probably where I'd use it for a strength athlete is the accessories. Um, and we've talked about this before, like the power building trap where you, you're, you've got like your strength phase and you think your tricep pushdowns need to be in like no higher than the six to eight rep range and maybe the four to six. And it's like, listen, you're standing up. There's no bar. You're, you're extending one joint. There is, there's no transfer from a directly from a tricep extension to a bench press. Doesn't matter if you're in strength phase. The reason you're doing a tricep extension is to grow your triceps so you hopefully can lift more weight because you have bigger triceps. So think of that kind of in isolation. Whatever you would do that makes sense on a tricep extension to grow your triceps, do that. And that might include length and partials. So ultimately, I think from a performance perspective, not all sports benefit from having bigger muscles, right? Um, and you're probably much better off thinking about what joint angles do I need to be strong at? What velocities do I need to be strong at? What types of loading demands am I going to have in my sport? Uh, what what planes of motion, et cetera. And my training should have some elements of that. Um, and then if you're a power lifter where it's always very sagittal plane and our training is our sport, I need to bench the most, squat the most, and deadlift the most, you're still going to train your primary lifts and your primary assistance lifts. So like variations on squat, bench, and deadlift the same. Um, but your accessories now are a place where you could potentially start incorporating, um, you know, these length and partials, basically your quote unquote hypertrophy or bodybuilding work. Eric, I don't know about you, but I try to keep it as specific as possible. So when I do that tricep extension, I work up to a single, and then I calculate my back down work based upon that from a percentage. I get commands on my tricep push downs. <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah. I don't know what I'm supposed to do when they say rack, <laughs> but I I do get commands just in case. And uh, generally, I wear wrist wraps. Um, I wear the bench specific belt, um, and I make sure to get into an arch position, which makes it very challenging. But uh, but yeah. Let, let me just say a uh, complete tangent, but I got to go there because a recent uh, uh, UFC event, and it, it is relevant kind of to what we're saying before, but the question of specificity, how specific can one be? Two things. Uh, so a lot of uh, fighters now, Eric, will try and simulate entering the octagon before to get over the jitters and so on and so forth. But I'm like, this is a controlled environment where you know exactly what's going to happen. There's so many unknowns when you're walking out, like how the fans are going to react, everything else. Like, so like, cool. I get, I get it, but I, I do like that. Like the applicability of specificity to a, a wide variety of different pursuits like whether or not that is specific enough or it will have any effect upon the person. Hmm. But the other thing I wanted to say, I don't, I don't know why, where you said the, the commands made me think of this. There was a fighter who did an atrocious job um, recently when we spoke about Flat Earthers, man. This guy, Cron Gracie, uh, Gracie, but he is actually a proponent and advocate of uh, the Flat Earth theory. And he says in interviews, he doesn't want to talk about it. I know that is not relevant to anything whatsoever, but just the idea that even as you entertain it more than the the notion and the people that kind of, kind of can be oblivious to, of course, is factually incorrect, where it opens up those gateways. I like, and this is now bringing it all the way back, that I think um, the way that you present all this, where like, here's where the current evidence is, here's what I'm doing, here are some examples, anecdotal examples, as is the case with Alberto, here's how you can do it, oh, you're not uh, related, uh, you're not uh, necessarily training only for hypertrophy, well, here are some conditions or some things you should think about as it relates to strength, where it gives the person the opportunity then to incorporate it to the, uh, the amount uh, that they then desire, that they're comfortable with. Because the other thing I'd say, Eric, is that while all the stuff is emerging and it sounds like very honestly intriguing, that for someone, if you've been training and it's been working and now you're looking at spicing it up or changing up a bit, it's your own level of comfort of what you choose to do. It certainly seems like it might be better overall that you do incorporate some length and partials, but it's kind of like a, a dealer's choice, so to speak. And I, I like that uh, component of this entire discussion, even even though like I, I think there are few areas, especially as it relates to hypertrophy, where maybe one can revisit something so fundamental and walk away with, you know, new takeaways. But yeah. No, that's a good framing. And I think as a science 
someone who, who tries to be a science communicator, the reason why I'm relatively comfortable kind of quote unquote endorsing like the partials is because like, let's say quote unquote worst case scenario where I end up being wrong. Oh my God. Um, first that's, that's great. That means we, we've, we've better learned something and I will absolutely talk about it because I'm, my job is not to appear smart. It's to accurately communicate information, but it is confusing to people and it can erode trust if I'm way off base. So why am I willing to endorse length and partials? It's not because we have overwhelming data because we don't right now. Like I said, we've got four studies where this has actually been experimentally directly evaluated while we have a lot of indirect work on stretching or doing like seated hamstring curls versus lying hamstring curls. So that like the, the underlying theory makes sense, but we only have four direct studies specifically comparing length and partials to uh, full range of motion training. And we have like two and a half of them that are clearly in favor of length and partials. So why am I confident? Well, because none of them go the other way, right? There's no reason for me to believe that you could potentially do harm here. And I think the people who are probably most likely to benefit from this, like you said, are people who they've maybe hit a wall or they, they're past the intermediate stage. Um, they are looking for new ways to, to grow. And since this won't be a negative, there is basically, there's no downside, you know, like, and Alberto talked about this uh, on another podcast. He was like, I don't really have time for the science to fully, fully, fully catch up and for us to have two meta analyses on, on, on it for, for me to do this. I'm 40. I'm placing top five at Worlds, but I'm not placing top three right now. I want to do better. I'm not going to lose muscle at this stage. It's hard to lose, lose yeah. muscle, and this is clearly not worse. But there's a potential here that is actually, you know, based upon the science, and, and it takes me some anecdotal leaps as well, where I could benefit from this. So this is one of those unique things where I'm a little excited about it because I'm in the same position as Berto, just less competitive, <laughs> but same physiological position. Like I'm, I'm scraping by to get gains here. And him getting a lot of back gains in that late stage from doing this and the research lining up, it's, it, it, gives, it gives some credence and some hope to it. And I think when you look at the potential downside, you said like dealer's choice, like, yeah, if you just keep doing full range of motion training and you're not ready to jump ship, you're, you're probably not going to lose anything, right? And also... If you do decide to jump ship and you go all in on this and you go way past my recommendations and you make everything you could possibly do length and partials, there's probably no downside except you could potentially take it too far and get a lot of muscle damage or get hurt if you're using the wrong exercises. And I think that is a, it is a point worth bringing up. But in terms of the actual outcome, it's not going to be worse. I'm very confident in that. And it could be better. So that is... So, so like I, I'm looking at oh, what's the most I have to walk it back is, oh, and it looks like length and partials are about as good as full range of motion training, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I'm pretty comfortable with that. I think that that is a, a hit that my ego and reputation could take. And it's also a calculated thing where, which I make all the time. I make these calculations all the time, you know? Um, like e even just the statement that I think vegetarian diets aren't healthier by mechanism it's more that the inclusion of fruits and vegetables i don't have like perfect rcd long-term data on that but that is the the only conclusion that one can make when looking at all the data that is most honest right um at least i think so that's the type of thing i'm doing here exactly what you were saying and um there's really no downside to trying this um, and any cost is pretty minor, like, oh, it's a little harder to track where the end of my range of motion is, but, but not really, you know? And, um, and yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's one of those unique things where we get to re-examine something, like you said, in the research that we were right. Full range of motion training is better than partials because most partials are the, the shortened partials, but it's not technically true. Um, when we really look at it and we start playing with these types of partials that are a little less common, and then we start to go, oh, and now that we understand that, that opens up a whole another pathway of trying to optimize something because we actually understand what is really going on at a deeper level. Why am I so confident? Have you seen Birdo's back? I mean, period, period. Man is looking like a turtle shell. Um, Eric, I will say that I think you covered a lot as it relates to length and partials, the applicability, um, you know, even as it relates, as we said at the very final little bit, uh, to strength training. Is there anything else that you want to cover related to this? 
as of right now, because I do like how Moore's on the way, as you said, about Milo and uh, a lot of different things and how uh, with you, uh, your case study, is there anything as of this point in time that you kind of want to circle back to? Yeah, I, did, I just want to emphasize that um, as much of, as I have explained why I'm happy to give this an endorsement, this is early days. Four studies is not a lot of studies. And it is very possible that another three come out and they all find null findings. Uh, and we go, oh, maybe this isn't that cool. Um, but that's the worst case. It's not going to be, it's probably not going to be worse. I'd be very surprised if that was the case. And um, another thing I would like to say is that while there's a lot of studies on this quote unquote stretch mediated hypertrophy now, there's eight of them. They're all from Warnicke and they're all in the calves. Yeah. So I am really intrigued to see how does this impact other muscles? Is this something that can apply to all muscles? Like I think it is, because we've got data on the arms, we've got data on quads and hams, we've got data on uh, the calves, but we don't have data on like everything. So there could be muscle specific effects. Uh, there, there, there could be a, a kind of a, a reversal of some of these positive findings towards being more towards the the null hypothesis that it's similar. So just keep keep eye on the space. Um, don't, don't be confused for my endorsement of saying like, this is the best thing ever and it's going to be amazing. And we still don't know why, which I think is kind of fun when you yeah. think about it, you know? So I'm, I'm intrigued as, as to the mechanism, um, how it ties in with, with quote unquote stretch mediated hypertrophy and uh, what exactly is going on. And there's still a lot more work to be done, but it's kind of opened up a field. Uh, and fortunately, it's also opening it up with some applied take-homes that we can start using now, even while we don't know why it works, we just know that it does. No, man, it, it is a very exciting time. And I mean, I think you said, it, Eric, maybe down the road, who knows, Warnicke, uh, Polish, yes? I think Warnicke is German. A German. Okay. I'm probably just pronouncing it terribly. No, no, no. But, but I was going to say that I, I wonder, because it, it it would be cool potentially um, if he does speak English or who, who knows uh, what the case might be. This person who's been doing all the studies, my first question, Eric, would be, What's your fetish with calves, man? Like, what's going on here? Like, yeah, we could talk. We could talk about full range of motion here, and then we're gonna find out something. Hey, uh, if if he's got a fetish for calves, so do I, because I I got the boot myself, and I've been doing uh, a calf training almost every day, and then then like my low volume calf training now is three times a week. So hey, das boot, man. No, Eric, fantastic, fantastic. I will say uh, to anyone and everyone who made it to the end of the episode, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Z Iron Culture, you could go ahead and leave a rating and review. You heard it today. One was a five star, one was a one star, and that is okay. We leave it to your own discretion. Typically, people will give five stars. We read them. We try and read them about every single week. We appreciate every single person, whether or not they leave a review. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Iron Culture. We're back every single insert date here from now until the end of time. We'll catch you in that next episode.